Greetings and welcome back to the Truth Fed Scripture Reading and End Time Prophecy Podcast. We are now up to chapter 25 in the book of Matthew. Now, I believe that this chapter is extremely important and deserves a lot of study and I recommend that you research and study this passage and do it often. Instead of reading three chapters from various books today, we are going to be focusing in on this one chapter alone because I think it's crucial and very relevant to the end times conversation. And it's about the parable of the wise and foolish virgins and the marriage supper of the Lamb and the parable of two talents. It's extremely uh, important to study and to get some type of grasp on uh, because I think uh, it's telling us some pretty important things. So we're going to be zeroing in on that today. And uh, so I'm going to be reading it to you, giving you some commentary. I'm going to read a section out of this little book that I have um, written by John Uh, MacArthur on this subject as well. So we're just going to try to unwrap it as best we can and uh, then you need to do further study on your own. Um, You know, so many people, they think, well, my pastor says this about it, so that must be true. Your pastor's not right about everything. Your favorite radio pastor's not right about everything. You're not right about everything. I'm not right about everything. It's important to study the Word for yourself. There's a lot of things in the Bible that people just don't want to touch. They don't want to discuss because they don't understand it or they've just accepted somebody else's commentary. You need to pray over the Word of God, then read it. Pray that the Spirit would help you discern what's taking place and give you understanding and wisdom. And then do some research. And then try to come to an understanding of what the Word is talking about. So that's what we're going to do today. Now today is the eighth day. Today is Monday. December 8th, the 8th day of the 21-day fast of Daniel that I have invited you all to partake in. Uh, So we've got one week down, two more to go. I have to be very honest, just straight honest with you guys. This has been a huge challenge for me. I didn't think it would be this challenging, uh, but it's been much more challenging than I ever thought it would be. Just eating only fruits and vegetables and drinking only water has been quite painful and challenging for me personally. Um, It's hard to eat salad without salad dressing and no cheese and no croutons. Um, This is a hard diet for those of us who live here in the U.S. or the Great Babylon, as I'm sure it was very challenging for Daniel when he lived in the Old Testament Babylon. And I've been thinking to myself um, just how spoiled we really are. I mean, how blessed we are, how much abundance we have, I'm bothered and even miserable at times if I'm to be honest and authentic uh, because I can't eat dairy or sugar or meat uh, or, or bread and I can't drink coffee and you know a large part of the world is eating very plain and boring food. They have a very plain and boring diet, the same things over and over and over and they're just happy to be surviving. They don't have the luxury of choice foods like breads and cakes and cheese and wine. There are millions of people, mostly children around the world, that would give anything to have a drink of clean water and have something, anything, to put in their stomachs. I'm doing this fast because, like Daniel, I'm trying to hear from God. I'm at a crucial place in my life and I need some prayers answered and I need it to happen quickly. But more than anything so far, I am getting a new perspective. And God has really given me a pretty blessed life so far. You know, even though the struggles and the pains that I've had, I've at least always had something to eat, something to drink. And over the weekend, My wife and I participated with this organization that basically selects hundreds of families that are in need in our area. Uh, These are families that don't have much of anything. They can't afford to buy Christmas presents for their children. Most of them don't have a Christmas tree, can't afford one, uh, can't afford Christmas dinner for themselves and their family. And uh, this awesome thing takes place in our community where thousands of people from different churches all around the community 
um, contribute, they donate money um, because it takes about $550 per family uh, to do what we're doing. And then hundreds of people show up and they take the money and they do the shopping and then they take it over to this other building and there's like a thousand people from our community in there and they're wrapping all the gifts. And then these trucks go out and these men and women, they go to these homes and they deliver the trees and then a few hours later, this other group of hundreds of people, or at least dozens for this particular part, go around and they show up with the presents at the doors and they pray with the families and they give them these gifts and a Bible. And uh, my wife and I are participants in this and uh, it was amazing. You know, over the weekend, we spent the day delivering these gifts and gift cards uh, for Christmas dinner and a Bible to these families and it was an amazing thing to be involved in. It really helped give perspective. Some of these homes and apartments were really, really bad. And the look on these kids' faces when you walked up to the door with a garbage bag filled with gifts and we prayed with these families in the name of Jesus. need to take inventory of the blessings that God has given you, my friends. If you woke up today and you got a roof over your head and you got food in the cupboard and water to drink, you were blessed. If you got clothes on your back, you're blessed. God has really been teaching me how to have the right perspective and I'm not good at it, folks. He's really been teaching me how to love other people and I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it. God have mercy on me, I'm not good at it. If you're doing the fast, I'd love to hear and know what your experience has been so far, if it's just been a struggle, if you've learned anything so far, I'd love to know about it. Please email me, sean at truthfed.com. Now without further ado, Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to read this chapter 25 in Matthew, and I'm going to discuss it the best I can with you, give you the best perspective that I can, uh, but it requires a lot of study, and I think it's important. So let's dig into the Word of God. Matthew chapter 25. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came along also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a faraway country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. 
And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground, and he hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over these few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed! into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison? and did not minister to you. Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So as you can see, some uh, pretty interesting things taking place here and it's not easy to dissect all of this um, but I think we should at least give it a shot we have these ten virgins which I believe and I could be wrong but my current belief is that these are ten believers ten believers Half of them were, were wise, and they were prepared. They filled their vessels. 
uh, and they were waiting on the bridegroom. They were watching and waiting. They were prepared for the Lord to return. And half of them, uh, they just kind of got tired of waiting. And they, they didn't they didn't prepare themselves. They didn't prepare their hearts for the return of the Lord. And then when the Lord finally showed up, half of them were ready to go. And they went into the marriage supper. And the other half, they weren't prepared. And they're banging on the door. And the Lord says, I don't know you. It ends that little parable by saying, watch. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I wonder how many Christians are literally watching and waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ who are getting on their knees every day and praying and repenting and asking that they can escape all the things coming upon this earth and praying that God would have mercy on them and asking for forgiveness and working their salvation out with fear and trembling every day. I wonder how many are doing that. And how many are just like, doo do I'm just going to live in the world. Uh, I've got the fire insurance. You know, I need to not worry about anything. I'm one of the elect. I don't need to worry about my sin or to take anything seriously. God's got it all under control. I'm just going to live however I, pl- I feel please, how I please. That's my interpretation of what's taking place here. Um, there's this book I read called The Second Coming by John MacArthur. It's a really good read. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that John has to say uh, in this book, but a lot of it I do agree with. And uh, it's really cheap, and it's a really quick and easy read. You can pick one of these up. Just go to truthfed.com. Right there on the main page, just scroll down a little bit. You'll see recommended resources, and uh, the book is right there. Um, I'd, I'd recommend that you check it out, but I want to read a couple of things that he had to say. Uh, he has a whole chapter basically dedicated uh, to, the, to chapter 25 in the book of Matthew. Uh, and I'm going to read a couple excerpts from it. Uh, peop- he says, People who have no expectancy of Christ's imminent return are inclined to develop careless spiritual habits. They become preoccupied with worldly things and grow apathetic about spiritual matters. I know so many Christians that are just really apathetic about spiritual matters. They say, oh, that was, you know, something that took pl- place back then. You know, those kind of spiritual things aren't taking place today. We have, we have too much intellect now. We don't need those types of things. They love the world. Yes, they show up, and I, and I believe that they're genuine in their hearts, most of them. And they, they, do, they do worship God, and they love Jesus, and they show up to church, and they donate some of their money. But their primary focus in life is not the Lord. It's the world. And they don't want to hear anything about the return of Christ. They all, they all think of that as something down the road. They don't want to hear about end time talk. Oh, that's something down the road. Every generation has thought this and that. And they just want to ignore it. They've, they've grown apathetic about spiritual things. Because they're preoccupied with worldly things. Did you see the game? They don't want to talk about Jesus. They want to talk about football. Then a couple pages into uh, this chapter, John MacArthur writes, The five bridesmaids who are prepared for the bridegroom represent true believers. The five foolish bridesmaids represent professing Christians whose hope of Christ's coming, like the faith they profess, is only superficial, temporary, and artificial. In other words, the five foolish bridesmaids represent people who do not truly know the Lord. Their expectations about Christ are not grounded in Scripture, so those expectations eventually go unmet. When that occurs, they suffer spiritual shipwreck, and as a result, they will not be prepared to meet Christ when He appears. We might say that the lamp each virgin carried pictures her outward intensity intensity with Christ or her testimony for him. In the imagery of this parable, those whose lamps burn out cannot be relit. For lack of fuel signify people who fail to persevere. I think that's an important point. Persevere. Paul talks about the, the you know this is a this is like a marathon you got to persevere over and over and over in the book of Revelation Jesus says persevere persevere in the faith 
and thereby demonstrate that they were never truly redeemed in the first place. Many people think that this uh, wedding, not all Christians will be invited. This marriage supper, not all Christians will be invited. Some people think it uh, has something to do with even the rapture. You know, Jesus comes back, he raptures those who are ready, ready to meet him. Not necessarily all of those who believe, but those who are ready and waiting and watching and doing the work of the Father. Jesus said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom, but those who do the work of the Father. I think it's interesting, Revelation in chapter 2 and 3, it's Jesus talking about these different types of churches, these different types of believers, and how they're going to be handled. In this corrupt church, the ones that's dealing with sexual immorality, which sounds like a lot of the church in America, says, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her will go into great tribulation. Great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill their children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your what? According to your works. But then there's this other church, these other group of believers. He says, I, see, I have I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have little strength, but you've kept my word and you have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jew and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Now listen to this. Because you have kept my command to what? Persevere. I also, remember, he told this other church, you're going to, you know, you're going to receive great tribulation. But he tells this church, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So on one hand, you've got a church who's just kind of you know, living the way they want. Sexual immorality, and Jesus says, you know, you need to repent. Or you're going into great tribulation. And the other church, he says, I'm going to keep you from that hour, that hour of trial, because you have kept my command to persevere. You've got to persevere. You've got to stay with it. Then we have the parable of the talents. You've got these, you know, these are all servants. I think it's interesting to note that all three of these guys are servants. Uh, one takes his talents and he does some great things with it. He, he you know, he's got, he comes back, he's got 10. The other one does great things with it. He's got two more than he was given. And the other one, you know, he was scared and he, he didn't do anything with his talent that he was given. He just buried it. And when the Lord showed up, he's like, here, you can have this, one, this talent back. I did nothing with it. The guy's like, you wicked and lazy servant. Give yours to the person who has ten. And because you're an unprofitable servant, keep in mind he's still a servant. I looked this word up um, uh, in the in the original language in Hebrew, and it's, it meant like slave. It meant servant. Uh, so this person was a servant. And he was cast into outer darkness. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I've been researching this. What is this outer darkness? And uh, I don't have it all together, folks. I don't really know for sure. But there's a lot of commentary out there and some thoughts out there that the outer darkness is uh, not hell, but kind of like not in the kingdom either. And it's an interesting study, and I, and I recommend that you take a look at it and see what you think. Uh, because it's important to notice that, you know, when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, he cast all the goats into what? He cast them into fire. 
everlasting fire that's prepared for the devil and his angels. So here we have this imagery of, of people being cast into hell. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that there's actually this huge movement of there is no hell and there's no hell in the Bible. I read this stuff all the time. People saying, there's no hell in the Bible. You're misunderstanding it. Uh, it Jesus clearly says, I'm going to cast you into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay. It says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment. But this servant, who was still a servant, but did nothing with his talents, wasn't cast into fire, prepared for the devil. He was cast into outer darkness. Something interesting. It may just be another uh, description of hell, but it may be something else. I think it's important to not just go along with the status quo, whatever my pastor says, or, you know, take it, get into God's word and try to understand what's actually taking place here. Look up the words. There's a free app. Um, if you have a s smartphone of any kind, um, let me get the name exactly right so I can tell you, where you can look up each individual word. Blue Letter Bible is what it is, and it'll let you look up each individual word and give you the definition of what that word actually meant. And you can look at other translations and try to get an idea of what this actually says. Uh, but anyway, I don't build any theology from that particular part. I just wanted to point that out and say that's worth giving a study. That's worth giving a study. Um, also important to study this parable of the wise virgins, and I recommend that you get that book um, if you're a reader from John MacArthur. Uh, again, go to truthfed.com. I've got it set up for you where you, can, where you can click it and find it easily. Be prepared, folks. Make sure you've got a heart of repentance, a heart of thanksgiving. Work your salvation out with fear and trembling, and persevere. I know it's hard, folks. I'm going through some stuff. I've had a really bad year, just a terrible year, one of the worst years I've had in a long time. And it seems like it's never going to change and never going to get better, but I refuse to lay down my faith. I refuse. I'm going to fall on my knees before the Lord Jesus Christ every single day, no matter what happens. No matter what. Because I want to persevere. Because I want to be invited to this marriage supper. I want to be in that banquet. I want to, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and get, be given position in heaven. Heaven's not just going to be everybody sitting around drinking tea on a cloud, folks. It's very clear. If you do a study of these things, you'll see that there's, it's, a, it's, it's a kingdom. People will have position and jobs and different things, and your position and your job will be given based on what you did with your time and your talents, as we can see here. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler, ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Store up treasures in heaven, folks. This world, it's passing away. This country is burning to the ground. And, you know, I enjoy things as much as anybody. Folks, I love technology. I love online gaming. I love basketball. I play a lot of basketball. I watch a lot of college basketball. I get it. But none of that stuff takes precedence over the Word of God. Because I know that this stuff is passing away. And I'm, I'm watching it happen before our very eyes. You should check out my YouTube channel if you haven't done that already or listen to some of the other things that I do. You'll see that this country is burning to the ground right before your very eyes. If you're in love with the world, you're going to be so disappointed. So disappointed. Anyway, that is, <laughs> that is my talk for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that it stirs something in your heart. And, uh, you know, you can be part of this. You know, you can be part of this kingdom. You can be invited to this marriage supper. Um, how amazing that's going to be. You just got to believe. You got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he is the son of God, that he came and he died for your sins. And that God raised him again from the dead. And turn away from your sinful ways. Repent. And be filled with the Holy Spirit.
that is it for today. I'll be back with you tomorrow, and we'll get back to our normal reading of three chapters. And we're still reading from Genesis and Revelation, and we're still got a couple more chapters left in Matthew. We're getting ready to get to the parts, the parts where he is betrayed and crucified and all of those things. I hope that you're enjoying your season of Advent, that you're preparing your hearts, not only for to celebrate uh, the coming of the Christ child, uh, but the second coming of Jesus Christ, which we wait for to this day. And uh, again, if you're doing the fast, I'd love to hear what your experience has been so far. So feel free to email me. That's it. Peace and grace be with you and God bless.